pretty um, forum meeting. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. So a couple of great topics for uh, presentation today. Joel, you wanna introduce okay. the- Yeah, no, great. Um, so um, yeah, really very excited about both presentations. So um, uh, um, Blake Martin and Tel uh, Bennett will be talking about children in SARS-CoV-2. So this work has been uh, going on for quite a while and is really uh, very eager to, uh, to to hear to hear updates, and I think people will enjoy the overview. And then uh, Chris Shute will be talking about Vulcan and OMOP to fire. Uh, and so I gather um, from um, uh, Usman, uh, the dashboard is unchanged. Let's see, uh, nine twenty. Uh, no, it's actually it's a different date, but I guess it's the same the same the same the same data. Uh, so we have a uh, two point six seven million COVID positive. Uh, cases, uh, 7.9 million uh, people. So the uh, uh, enclave is continuing uh, to function in its remarkable manner. So Chris, yeah, you're on. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm Chris Shute from Johns Hopkins. And I confess that is a hard act to follow. Um, I, I will do my best to uh, not disappoint, but um, uh, I, I should hesitate to uh, uh, let's, oh, I see it's, it's covered there. Uh, I, I want to be clear that what I'm presenting is a not a yet fully approved uh, proposal to the Vulcan community. Uh, and, and you'll see why uh, basically as, as we move along. So this is not a, a report on a project that is even underway, but a, a report on a project that is being proposed and has a high probability of being underway, but uh, nevertheless, there was interest in it. So here we are. So the, the problem that we all face is that clinical research, real world data, whatever the heck you wanna call it, is really coming into its own. Uh, the emergence of, of EHRs over the past decade uh, as very rich resources of clinical outcomes and, and uh, correlation uh, is being recognized and it's a major source of clinical evidence and discovery. That being said, creating a research data warehouse in any given organization remains a an expensive and laborious process. It's not easy to create a PCORnet data set or an OMOP data set uh, as it stands today. Uh, OMOP uh, is perhaps the most common and robust data model for EHR data warehouses. I think this is uh, evidenced by the All of Us Consortium uh, choosing uh, OMOP. N3C obviously chose OMOP. Uh, most of NIH is using OMOP. Uh, and it is, uh, I think, emerging as a, as a very uh, significant uh, and clear uh, choice for research common data models uh, in, in, uh, actually across the world. So if that's all true, then the notion of having a reusable fire to OMOP mapping has the potential to dramatically reduce the cost and effort to maintain a research data warehouse. Right now, major academic medical centers can build a data warehouse, but the average community hospital could not realistically uh, mount a, an OMOP data set, uh, never mind uh, you know, engage in other uh, linkages to it, but it's, it's, it's a barrier uh, in its current configuration and rendering in most parts of, of uh, the world. So this is a pipeline that should be familiar to you. Uh, as you know, in N3C, we take in a number of common data models, four major, uh, data models, OMOP, ACT, Trinetics, and PCORnet, and render a complete N3 data set. Pertinent to this talk is down in this corner, we've said for a long time now that HL7 FIRE can and should be a potential for another a data set. And I'll reshow this slide at the end of, of this very brief talk um, to show how this would fit in. Uh, but for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, FIRE is uh, an emerging, uh, actually, I would say it's, it's an achieved uh, data standard for exchanging electronic health record data. Uh, and again, it's a global standard, part of HL7. Um, it is a de facto object model for uh, representing data in electronic medical records. They call these data objects resources, uh, but they can be rendered as JSON objects or anything else. Uh, and they very clearly define the syntax and large scale semantics of electronic health record data. Most uh, implementations of HL7 FIRE are really done at the interchange layer. 
if you dig under the hood of an epic system or something, you're not going to find fire. You're going to find chronicles and and uh, mumps and and other kinds of of uh, real time uh, transaction engines. It's not really designed to be a real time transaction engine. It's an interface layer, uh, and so many systems only make uh, fire evident at the API interface level. That being said, there are some organizations and EHR vendors that are trying to migrate these formal reproducible standardized structures closer to the data source um, that may continue to happen over time. But for our purposes, it's sufficient that uh, HL7 Fire exists as a practical interface to get comparable and consistent data out of the information uh, in an EHR. Now, for those of you that haven't heard, uh, the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, which was a congressional act in the United States, requires that standards-based interoperability APIs be implemented across all EHR vendors uh, that do business in the United States. Uh, uh, somewhat later, a few years later, uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, issued their final rule uh, a year ago, specifying that that API that the 21st Century Cures Act had specified will be fire. Uh, so now we're having regulatory pressure uh, to make sure that all EHR systems in the United States support fire. And as of 2020, uh, they had to support fire for patient access, provider directory, and payer to payer exchange. That still subsumes lots of data. I mean, that's diagnosis, that's procedures, that's laboratories, that's medications, uh, demographics. It's a lot of data that you would find in something like an OMOP data set. Not everything uh, yet is regulatorily required, but ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator uh, for Health Information Technology, is year by year increasing the scope of what these API regulatory requirements are. And the expectation that is within five years, all that you would expect to be in an OMOP data set would be available by regulatory pressure uh, in uh, uh, EHRs that are sold in the United States and be somewhat reliable. Well, you might say having an API is not sufficient. Um, not everybody uses the same codes. Not everybody has the same uh, renderings. And historically, that's certainly been true. Uh, the, the big challenge of, of this uh, heterogeneity of EHRs across the United States was a big barrier to data integration and coordination. But in parallel with the, with the FHIR requirement is what's called, again, this comes from ONC, uh, the U.S. Core for Data Interoperability, uh, and version two just came out a few months ago. What this does is bind terminologies and value sets to the domains like medications, domains, and labs. Uh, and it has been modified to form the US Core Fire Implementation Guide. Uh, so the combination of fire syntax and the US Core Fire Implementation Guide for this bound semantics, there specifies a highly reproducible, comparable, and consistent data structure that is available from EHRs today. You can see this. For those of us, us that used Fire APIs four or five years ago, what we got out of our own EHRs, whether this was at, at Mayo Clinic where I was originally or now at, at Hopkins, was an inconsistent, uh, and that's a kind word, inconsistent uh, body of data that adhered to Fire Syntax. The data that you get out in 2021 is much more consistent and comparable. There's been a palpable uh, improvement in conformance with the US Core for Data Interoperability and with FHIR, the, the completeness of FHIR APIs that are implemented uh, in EHRs today. So what does that mean if you put it together? Well, as I said, the curse of locally divergent electronic health record data may be resolvable. And it may be resolvable not with action that N3C would take or that CTSA would take or that even that the research community would take, but this is regulatory pressure coming at higher levels of government on the clinical community and the opportunity to support a generic fire to OMOP tooling is feasible because of the 21st century cures and US core for data interoperability enabling 
comparable and consistent interfaces to EHR data at scale um, in every EHR in the country. I'm being a bit glib because for those of you that know the fire reality today, know that mostly fire today, oh, actually not mostly, exclusively, fire today operates on a patient by patient basis. And if you were, let's say Hopkins has 7 million patients in its record. If you were to fire 7 million complex queries against our transactional EHR, the operations people would be kind of mad at us um, because this, this would be a drain on the system. And if we're gonna do it every week to create a new repository, uh, they'd probably make me find a new line of work. Uh, the alternative to this line by line, patient by patient query is what's called flat fire or bulk fire uh, that operates at a cohort level. And it's in prototype and it's been uh, evaluated but they expect to release it as part of the standard fired component next year in 2022. This will transform the way fire works against EHR. So not only can you do it for a cohort of patients, let's say the cohort of patients that are existing in the N3C in your institution, but more pertinently, you can do it for the entire EHR uh, population. And at, this is where the at scale uh, interoperability of this uh, actually comes to the fore, and we're able to support um, large-scale interface and extraction of EHR data, again, in a comparable and consistent format. I can't emphasize this comparability and consistency enough, because one of the biggest challenges to making OMOP uh, instantiations today in most academic medical centers is a lot of the handwork that goes into the final mapping of, of you know, this term to uh, the OMOP uh, standard code and uh, uh, from the source EHR information. And it typically takes uh, six or seven months uh, of multiple people working pretty much full time at any organization to generate a, a reasonably robust OMOP data set uh, as part of a data warehouse. Uh, and the opportunity to have this done um, in a generic way is transformative. Well, enter the notion of fire accelerators. Uh, uh, HL7 recognizing that the scope of their project, the Argonaut project, which came out of the Jason report, it was, yes, Jason and the Argonauts, uh, focused initially on clinical data. Uh, Karen is focusing uh, on uh, 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 consumer-oriented data. Codex is for cancer, Da Vinci is for uh, the insurance industry, uh, and Vulcan is for trans transformational research. Um, so that the fire accelerators are a, a partnership between academic communities, business communities, uh, users of the data, providers of the data, clinical organizations to work together to accelerate specific areas of fire enhancement. So Codex is obviously focusing on cancer, as I said. So the NCI and the cancer community and contractors are working heavily on that. Uh, the Da Vinci is very heavily subsidized by the insurance industry who have an interest in making sure that fire works well and effectively. Uh, and what Vulcan is, is the accelerator uh, newly formed uh, for clinical and translational research. And remember, N3C is run by the uh, Center for Data to Health um, uh, as part of a CTSA uh, large contract uh, from NCATS. Uh, and the S Center for Data to Health actually contributed to catalyzing the creation of the Vulcan Accelerator. So we now have a, an organization, uh, I sit on the steering committee as does uh, Ken Gersing and, and others, uh, Anita, I believe, is, is a major component on the uh, contributor to the operations committee, as are other CD2H people. So it's a, a, a partnership of standards development organizations, industry, vendors, academia, patients, and government agencies to accelerate making um, FHIR effective and work for clinical and translational research. One of the manifestations of clinical and trans now, so a lot of this is focused on clinical trials and ensuring that clinical trials protocols can be populated from fire resources. But as we enrich the, the 
depth and scope of what can be populated for clinical trials, we at the same time uh, expand the depth and scope of what can be taken out of EHRs for observational data, including OMOP. And of course, clinical and translational research data subsumes as well observational data. So there's, it is a focus of what we're trying to do. Now back to our, our pipeline, as I described, I've, I've rejiggered this lower corner where I've removed it from a future to a putative reality. Uh, and I would say that our tactical goal in the Vulcan pipeline is to enable the ingestion of data in a pipeline that we've already built that can ingest from other sources to create OMOP output specifically for the N3C uh, community and the N3C op uh, operation. That would allow any organization, uh, community hospitals, as I said, federally qualified health plans that don't have large IT groups to be able to contribute data through this pipeline without a great deal of local uh, uh, machination and, and curation. Certainly not the, the, the uh, person years uh, that were required to build an OMOP data set previously. A strategic goal is to leverage HL7 Vulcan as a coordination and resource opportunity to enable the creation of local OMOP warehouses anywhere without human effort, without meaningful human effort. Basically, import the software stack, add water, and get an OMOP data set from the, e the uh, uh, fire interfaces against your uh, EHR environment uh, that is conformant, assuming your EHR environment is conformant with uh, the full fire implementation guide and has all the APIs available, uh, the implementation guide for the US core. Create a software stack that would algorithmically create OMOP from compliant Fire API, and then prototype this with US Core. Now, I focused fairly exclusively on the US Core for feasibility. From an HL7 point of view, and indeed from a Vulcan point of view, we'd want to engineer this in a way that it could logically support any national Fire implementation guide. The US Core is the most robust at present, but we don't want to be necessarily as HL7 is an international organization, as is the Vulcan Accelerator, they're very, very cognizant that this is not a US only goal or aspiration, uh, that we want to build something that could um, specify a US core, but could correspondingly specify a fire implementation guide in any other country. For example, in the UK, they don't necessarily use RX norm um, as their uh, medication uh, scheme. They use SNOMED for the most part. Um, so that could be engineered to in, in, ingest a SNOMED and do the ETLs and transform. It turns out that, that uh, within native OMOP, they, they actually use RX norm, uh, but the transformation pipes could vary by country to country based on their implementation guides. So this was a relatively short intro to what we are doing, um, uh, what we are proposing to do. It has been uh, vetted before the operations committee uh, and has been uh, given as a likely project to the uh, steering committee, uh, but the steering committee has not formally approved. It's not within the cycle of, of review um, uh, to go through fully through approval at this time. So I'm presenting it as a, um, something that is obviously highly relevant to N3C, something further that I think would actually contribute to the entire uh, translational uh, and clinical research communities and can and should scale uh, to organizations uh, uh, across our country, of course, with the US core and ideally the world. So with that, I'll stop for questions. Um, Chris, this is... Um... I just want I uh, just wanted to answer a couple of questions on the chat. Um, in in the um, very near future, between uh, in the next month or two, we will show you a working version of of what Chris described, um, and that will also include the ability to um, go from any model, any data model, to any model. So. One of our desires is to lower the cost of, of institutions um, having to maintain multiple data models. So if you could 
um, if you could imagine, if you put it in bulk, but could save as OMA, save as PCORI, save as ACT, save as Trinetics, you would, it would be a lot lower maintenance costs. And, um, and, this, and this really is an answer to you for my thesis is that um, that proposal that we, we call that, that well, Chris calls the um, one model to other models pluripotent, and I, I love that term, um, refer, referring to MedMorph. Uh, MedMorph actually was spun out of our project. Um, it is a CDC project, but it is a completely parallel to what we are working with the CDC, ONC, and NIH on, on, on the um, using fire as, as this transformative model. Um, uh, so I, I, I just wanna you know, encourage you guys, we'll be showing you this in, in hopefully weeks to a couple of months. We've, we've worked on this very hard. Yeah, and, and uh, to answer your question also, uh, Mike, uh, Vulcan is the uh, accelerator for uh, clinical and translational research. MedMorph is being proposed as a new HL7 uh, fire accelerator for public health. Uh, and so the complementarity is very clear, uh, but it's all under the same family of HL7. Uh, all the fire accelerators work quite well. In fact, we're borrowing a lot of work from a codex in the cancer world. Uh, it would overlaps with clinical and translational research, as you might imagine. And I expect MedMorph will continue, as, as Ken pointed out, uh, in, in his uh, clinical data harmonization community projects across FDA, CDC, uh, NIH, and others um, uh, would correspondingly uh, overlap significantly and, and collaboratively uh, in a role as a, as a fire accelerator. So Chris, I, I think it'd actually be interesting uh, if, you, if you gave kind of a high level overview of what the accelerator program is, fire accelerator program is in general. Well, I, I did that. Um, I'll do it again. Um, let's see. So here, uh, these accelerators are what HL7 created. I mean, that's a whole family of programs and MedMorph might be added to this list. They, they'll probably call it something different for public health. Right now, there is no public health accelerator. Um, but it is a, a partnership between and among uh, business, industry, academia, and standards developers to accelerate the creation of fire and particular fire components that are of interest to that domain. The example I, I, I emphasized was Da Vinci, that is uh, really a coalition of uh, payers, uh, both uh, CMS and private insurers who work together, organize together to make sure that fire can do payer to payer uh, and uh, uh, also um, provider to payer transactions uh, completely and effectively. And where fire falls short, the Da Vinci community funds the development of enriching fire resources and specification to ensure that this use case of, of payer to payer and, and insurance coverage can be covered effectively in the fire specification. Correspondingly, so these, go ahead. Go. So do these things, I'm sorry, do, do these things live in HL7? I mean, I mean, I get what the motivation is and who the some of the players are, but from an organizational point of view, say if somebody on, on the call wanted to join an accelerator, where's the there there? Who actually runs these things? HL7. HL7. This is all coordinated and integrated through HL7. HL7 designates an accelerator uh, and defines its scope of activity. You have to apply to HL7. So we apply to HL7 to create the Vulcan accelerator. I see. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see, there was this other question. Um, uh, was the underlying code in the pipeline? Well, it hasn't been written yet. Um, and. Uh, is there a means to do PPRL in this context? I would think so, very much so. Uh, that, that could continuously enrich. Uh, one of the principles of HL7 is that when we complete our code, and of course there are drafts and lots of people have been working on this problem, we, we really want to integrate the existing work that's been done on, on fired OMOP. Interestingly, most of the work has been done in the other direction, um, OMOP to fire putting fire servers on top of OMOP data sets. 
And so a lot of this interoperability uh, is, is a lot of the mapping has already been done in the opposite direction. When I showed you that pipeline map uh, for uh, the N3C pipeline, we actually had over 2 million semantic transforms humanly verified in that particular map. So the software stack we're talking about is going to be a mix of both software and transform logic, uh, mapping logic to go from fire content, uh, US core API, uh, for data interoperability into, uh, uh, into OMOP. But uh, uh, I'll, I think I'll stop there because we've got two minutes. Okay, last question. Okay, participation accelerators by paid membership. Okay, all right, that's very exciting, Chris. I, I think this this obviously could make a, a huge a huge difference, and it would be interesting offline to actually talk about uh, DICOM uh, relationship of DICOM and some of these 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 things. But uh, we we don't have time. But uh, and John, thanks for your comment. Yes, uh, I I was aware of this uh, upcoming uh, workshop, and you're right. It's it's very tight. We hope to you know, whether who's on, whether Vulcan's on first or, or the workshop is on first, we don't really care as long as the work gets done and, and uh, we can synergize our activities. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chris. And uh, great, great earlier, earlier talk. And uh, uh, let's see one last message. Uh, thanks, Chris. Okay. Uh, have a good, have a good week. Bye-bye.